How's everybody doing today? You excited to be here? Yeah. We are excited that you are here. Amen. No place we'd rather be than right here with you. Praise the Lord. I invite you to open your Bible, if you will, to the 23rd Psalm. Now you can still get excited about the 23rd Psalm, you know. Probably, probably something that... I dare say probably one of the most familiar passages in all of the scripture. And it's pretty short, but it's pretty powerful. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Psalms 23 started with verse number 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green, green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Oh, I'm so glad that he does that, aren't you? Yes. You know, you're, as we go through, of course, the title of today's message is He Restores My Soul. You know, your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions. And so the Bible says, He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you're with me. Oh, thank God for that promise. For you're with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Well, that's a good outlook on life, isn't it? Oh, I tell you, you could break that down and preach message after message on the 23rd Psalm. But you know, the 23rd Psalm is just simply a formula for carefree living. There's just something about the 23rd Psalm. When you begin to read it, it just causes a peace to come over you. Why? Because you realize He restores my soul. He takes care of me. I have no reason to fear. You're the good shepherd. Mercy and goodness, follow me. All of those good, just bring such a peace. Amen. Amen. Just bring such a peace. Well, having a positive outlook on life is a good thing. As opposed to what? Anybody, we got grandkids, so, so when they're over, it's, it's, you know, it's Winnie the Pooh. And so everybody knows Eeyore, don't you? Well, Eeyore doesn't have a positive outlook on life. He's, he's, you know, oh well, wasn't much of a tail anyways. And something always is going on. You, you ever been around somebody like that? I mean, they're just negative, and they're just negative, and they're just negative. I mean, they, you know, a lot of people try to find the good in every situation. They find the negative in every situation. Come on now. Well, having a positive outlook on life and exercising your authority in Christ as believers is essential. It's essential to living a carefree life and, in fact, staying carefree. And, you know, you can live life that way. You can live a carefree life and you can stay that way. I'll never forget it as my, my grandparents got up in age, and, and we were visiting them. We'd go about once a year, and we'd go through Dallas on the way to Austin. We'd stop by. And, and in his latter years, you know, my grandfather's uh, getting up in age, and, and, you know, if something come up or, or if something negative happened or anything of that sort, you know, he, you start asking questions, and he would always say, he would always stop, and he would say, John, we don't have any problems here. And that just resonated with me because it didn't matter the, the depth of the situation. It didn't matter what all was going on. He always had the outlook of, how bad can it be? We got no problems here. Well, I've tried to adopt that. You know, the things come up in life, man. Challenges, tests, trials, things come up in life. But you know, that's a good way to live. Whenever you approach every situation in life and you just say, you know what? We don't have any problems here. Why? It's outlined in the 23rd Psalm. Amen. I said it's outlined in the 23rd Psalm. Look over, you're there in Psalm, look, look over at uh, 3 John 2. 3 John 2. Again, another familiar passage of Scripture. This is John 
writing to Gaius, noting, noting, and we'll read this, but he's noting that the condition of your soul, again, now we're talking about your mind, your will, and your emotions, the condition of your soul has a great deal to do with the overall physical and spiritual health that you experience. And so he tells him here, he says in verse number 2, he says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Notice that, even as your soul prospers. So, so John is telling him that the condition of your soul has a great deal to do with your overall spiritual health. Sure. That's what he's talking about. Again, we're talking about your mind, your will, and your emotions. Sheila and I went to Oral Roberts University and and as you study some of Oral Roberts' early uh, writings, you know, he, he got a revelation of this. And when you went to Oral Roberts University, you know, they, they focused on the whole man. You know, they give out what they call a whole man scholarship, spirit, soul, body. And they emphasize spirit, soul, body. You know, you're there to educate your mind, but then, you know, you're there to educate yourself spiritually. But then they also emphasize being physically fit. And so, you know, there was a part of that curriculum part of those three things that were involved in every part of the curriculum. You know, we, we had to, every single semester, you had to be a part of a, a physical education class. And uh, every, every semester you had to uh, run three miles. First semester you ran a, a mile and a half, kind of to, to get you into it. But then every semester after that you had to run three miles and you had to do it under a certain time. And you had to log your physical fitness. And, you know, so they were emphasizing all of these things. But, but Oral Roberts got a hold of this, and it, it was a truth that he began to establish that, that you know, God cares about a spirit, soul, and body. Yes. And so again, John is discussing this with Gaius, and he says that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. But now watch this. This is the same thought. This is the same thought. He says, For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, even as you walk in that truth, for I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. See, all of this, see, beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul, it's all tied to walking in the truth. Walking in the truth of the Word of God. Can you see that? You know, Isaiah 26, 3, talking about, you know, we're talking about uh, emotional, we're talking about uh, your mind, your will, your emotions. In, in Isaiah 26, 3, it says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind, everybody point to your mind, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. Because he trusts in thee. So what does that mean? If your mind is stayed, that means that it's fixed. It's settled on something. But notice it's tied to, again, it's tied to truth. It's tied to trust. When you trust somebody, you stick with them. When you trust somebody, you're fixed, you're settled, and that trust is built on an established relationship. Yes. You know, we, we, we go through life and, and, you know, we experience restaurants. A lot of us will go out to a restaurant today. Well, you go to a restaurant that, that oftentimes you go back to a restaurant because you had a good experience there. Or maybe you, you go to a particular bank because you trust them with your money. Right? You wouldn't go down the road to Joe on the corner over there and say, here's my paycheck. Would you take care of this for me? No, you, you put your money in a bank with somebody you can trust. You, you, you know, we used to, we used to say, or, or you know, if you're the older generation here, you, you used to make the comment, we trade at so-and-so. You know, when I first, first got into uh, working when I was 13 years old, I worked at a local grocery store. And so people would come in and they would say, I trade at Williams Market. Well, back in the day, you know, people would actually barter for goods. You know, you wouldn't just go in there and pay money. You would actually trade. You know, I have something to offer and you have something to offer me, so we would trade goods. Well, they built confidence in a relationship with that individual they're trading with, and, and so that relationship is established, and actually it got to a point where, where many people would come in and they would say, put it on my credit. You know, I'm going to get some groceries today. Put it on my credit. Now, don't go down to the Walmart today and tell them that because that ain't going to work for you. <laughs> so you would build that relationship. You would build that trust, and they would trust you because, you know, you would keep your bill. You would pay your bill, right? And so that would, that would uh, make allowance for that. But again, when you trust someone, you stick with them. 
You're fixed, you're settled. So the Bible says, whose mind is stayed, who's fixed, it's settled because he trusts in thee. So this morning, what I'm wanting to get across to you is that your mind can be established such on the, so, to such a point on the Word that you don't have to mess with turmoil and tests and trials and allowing them to be consumed with you. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind has stayed on thee. You say, is that possible? Yes, it is. I said, yes, it is. But it takes diligence on your part. It takes you doing your part. Look over at Proverbs chapter 3. Oh, this is a good message if you'll get a hold of it. I said this is a good message. Proverbs chapter 3, starting with verse number 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He'll direct your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil. Notice it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Did you know this doesn't work in reverse? I said this doesn't work in reverse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Look over, uh, you're there in Proverbs, go over to Mark chapter 4. Trust in the Lord. Somebody say, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Glory to God. Mark chapter 4, starting with verse number 35. This is Jesus with His disciples. It says, In the same day when the evening was come, He said unto His disciples, Let us pass over to the other side. Goal number one. What's goal number one? Pass over to the other side. He said, Boys, get in the boat. Let's go to the other side. Well, how many of you know that was a mandate? That was the plan. This is what we're doing. This is where we're going. Get in the boat. Let's go to the other side. And as far as Jesus was concerned, that settled it, didn't it? Yeah. And he, he goes on to say, it says in verse 36, And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there was also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so it was now full. The ship was filling up with water. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. The wind is such... It, now, I don't know if you've ever been on a boat. But if the boat is filling up with water because the waves are crashing, everybody on the boat should know it. Guaranteed. So the water's coming into the boat. The boat's filling up with water. The Bible says Jesus is asleep in the back. So notice, he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on the pillow, and they had to awake him. And they said unto him, Master, do you not care that we're dying here? In other words, if you cared, you would be worrying with us. If you cared, you'd be awake. If you cared, you'd be helping us shovel the water out. Master, do you not care? Can't you just picture him waking up and going, leave me alone, I'm trying to sleep. Come on now. And it says in verse 39 that he arose, he rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased. Oh, I like this next part. And there was a great calm. What does the Bible say? It was a great storm followed by a great calm. Listen, you might be in the midst of a great storm this morning, but Jesus says to you this morning, peace be still. Hallelujah. There's getting ready to be a great calm Amen. if you place your trust in Him. Amen. A great storm is getting ready to be followed by great calm. Guaranteed. Oh, somebody say, peace be still. Peace be still. What are we talking about? Where was Jesus? He was asleep. He was resting. Well, you know, there's a number of scriptures in the Bible that tells us, that declares that faith rests. If you've placed your trust in Him, faith rests. 
In other words, the turmoil of your mind and you trying to figure out your situation, faith rests. Faith trusts in God and faith says, lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him and He'll bring it to pass. Don't, just, just quit trying to figure it all out. You're not smart enough anyways. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, you're not smart enough. <laughs> quit trying to figure it all out. Just place your trust in Him and say, Lord, I trust You. Figure this out. If there's something that I need to do, then you show me. And then you just sit back and you just wait for a great calm. Oh, thank God. I said thank God. Thank God. 1 Corinthians 2.16 2, tells us, but we have the mind of Christ. You know what Jesus was saying here? Jesus was saying, I'm at rest. You ought to be at rest. Well, Jesus gave them a mandate, didn't he? He said, we're passing over to the other side. He didn't say, now boys, get in the boat. There might be a, a storm coming. There might, I see a storm brewing. Now you better prepare. He, no, he said, let's just go to the other side. So Jesus was saying, I'm at rest, so you be at rest. Did you know that your calmness in the midst of the storm has an effect on those around you? Sure. Amen. Oh, you better believe it does. I said, you better believe it does. You all worked up about a situation and you're fretting about it and, and you're talking about it and, and you're talking about it more than you are about faith and trust in God and you're magnifying the devil and you're talking about all the different ways it can go bad. You're affecting those around you. You're causing stress on those around you. You're causing others to get into fear and worry and doubt and unbelief. No, you stay calm. Yes. You keep your trust in Him. Somebody say, my mind is my mind. My mind, is my mind. Well, it's important to declare it, isn't it? It's important to declare my mind is my mind. The Bible says we have the mind of Christ. My mind is my mind. You know, it's important to declare. Job twenty two twenty eight says that you shall declare a thing and it shall be established for you so light will shine on your ways. Oh, there's something about saying the Word of God, speaking, confessing the Word of God. My mind is my mind. What does that mean? The devil's not controlling my mind. Those thoughts of fear and worry and doubt and unbelief, they don't belong there. My mind is my mind. And I have a calm mind. I have a peace mind. Peaceful mind. It's what the Word declares. Why is that so important? Because every single day, there's a battle that takes place in your mind. I said every single day there's a battle that takes place in your mind. A battle that has to be won and re-won. And you've got to be diligent to do your part. Yeah. Romans 12, 2 tells us to renew our mind. You, you. Everybody point yourself and say, me. me. Renew my mind. Yeah. How do you renew my mind? According to the Word of God. There was a boy, you know, like I said, Sheila and I went to Oral Roberts University. And there, was a, uh, there was a boy, there was a freshman when, like, like me, there, we were the only two freshmen and we were on this senior floor. You know, it was all seniors and, and me and him, two freshmen. And so I got to know him a little bit and, and uh, he was a mama's boy. Everybody knows what a mama's boy is, don't you? And so, uh, so I walked into his room. He, you know, him and his roommate were unpacking their stuff and and I walked into his room to, to introduce myself, talk to him a little bit. And, and I looked out on his, on his uh, bed. And laid out on his bed was this binder. You know, and, and uh, in this binder, everybody remember Polaroid photos? Yeah. Well, he had a binder that he had slipped these Polaroid photos in. Actually, what happened is his mama prepared this binder with these Polaroid photos. And so as I was flipping through this, this Polaroid photo album was full of pictures of himself in different outfits. <laughs> and I said, what is this? And he said, well, he said, my mama had me get dressed in all of my outfits. He lost me there. <laughs> well, he said, my mama had me get dressed in all my outfits and she took a picture of it so that when I got to school, I would have the proper outfit on. In other words, you know, these pants go with this shirt and this shirt goes with this tie. He was a nice young man. 
That lasted about two weeks. Because what happens after two weeks with a college kid? You don't do your laundry. Your laundry's on the floor over here. It's disgusting. It's a mess. It stinks. You hadn't done your laundry because you just don't want to. So now all of a sudden, those Polaroids don't mean a thing. He became a hot mess. Oh, I'm telling you, he, he became a hot mess. He started dressing like you, you wouldn't believe. Man, he, he was a hot mess. I said, man, what's happening here? I said, what happened to all your Polaroids? He said, he said well, he said, my outfit situation didn't work out because I hadn't done my laundry. I said, well, you reckon you ought to do your laundry? He said, well, I'm about at that point. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter what provision is made for you if you don't do your part. Come on now. If you don't do your part, then the provision doesn't mean a thing. God has made provision for us for every area of life. Spirit, soul, body. He's made provision for us. But if we don't do our part, we're going to be a hot mess. Guaranteed. So what do you got to do? You got to stay in the Word. You got to renew your mind. Are you with me? She couldn't come to his laundry for him. As much as she probably wanted to. Well, again, the Lord has set certain things in motion for our benefit, but we must keep ourselves in position to reap the benefit. See, the Bible doesn't specifically mention mental health. You know, mental health is a hot topic right now. Mental health. But the Bible does talk extensively about a person's emotions, their mind, their soul, again, mind, will, emotions, talks about their heart, talks about their thought life. You know, it's a sad thing, but it's said that, that 264 million, everybody say million, million, 264 million people struggle with depression and 40 million struggle with anxiety every single year. But we have the Word of God. As Christians, as believers, you have an answer for that anxiety. You have an answer for that depression. 1 Peter 5, 7, God declares the answer. He says, casting all of your care over on Him, for He cares for you. One translation says, the whole of your care. In other words, not just a little bit. Lord, if you can take this part, then I can handle the rest of it. No, the Bible says, cast all of your care over on Him. Psalm 42, 11 says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. I shall yet praise Him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Well, that tells you the answer right there. Place your hope and trust in Him. Quit fretting about your thing. Quit worrying about how you're going to figure it out, how you're going to make it. Trust in God. You say, Pastor, that's easy for you to say. No, I deal with the same thing you do. Just because you deal with mental health issues and, and mind issues and cares and work doesn't make you less of a Christian. It makes you human. Sure. Take that pressure off yourself. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. It just means you're dealing with life. Sometimes life can smack you right between the eyes. Life gives you something to deal with. Go over at Philippians chapter 4. Are you with me this morning? Philippians chapter 4, verse number 6. It says, be careful for nothing, but in everything. Be careful for nothing. Don't worry, don't fret. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and your mind through Christ Jesus what does it tell us be careful for nothing but in, in everything with prayer and supplication with thanksgiving with thanksgiving I like in one translation in verse 7 it says, His peace will come in like a garrison of soldiers in a turbulent country to bring peace. To bring peace. 
Well, a garrison of soldiers is, is it's a big body of troops that are stationed to defend against the enemy. Well, see, the Bible tells us that His peace will come into your situation and defend against the enemy. Thank God for His peace. Jesus, in one of His last messages to His disciples before He left, in John 14, 27, says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. In the Amplified, it reads, Let my perfect peace calm you, in every circumstance, and give you courage for every challenge. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. This is talking about Elijah. I mean, you know, Elijah was a dude. He did some things. He was notable. We know about Elijah. Elijah did some great things, had some great moments in his life. The Bible tells us that he prayed and he kept it from raining for three years. The Bible says that he prayed down fire from heaven. The Bible tells us that he slew the prophets of Baal. It tells us that he prayed for rain in the midst of a three-year drought. The Bible tells us that Elijah, with the, that the Spirit of God came on him and he outran the king's chariot 14 miles across the plain. Elijah. But now look here for a moment. In Elijah, or in 1 Kings chapter 19, the Bible tells us in verse number 4, actually go, go up to, uh, so let's just start with verse number 1. It says, And Ahab told Jezebel that all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain the prophets with the sword, and Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, Let the gods do to me, and more so, if I make not your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow. In other words, Jezebel's decided she's going to kill Elijah. So when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. Now listen, this is Elijah. This is Elijah that, that prayed for it to rain, and it rained for three years. Then he prayed in the midst of a drought. Excuse me, he prayed that it kept the rain from coming for three years. Then he prayed in the midst of the drought. The Bible, you remember that list? And here's Elijah running from Jezebel, and it says, But he went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. Take me now, Lord. I can't take any more. You ever felt that way? He didn't mean this though. Because if he just wanted the Lord to take him, what could he have done? Just stayed where he's at. Jezebel was, Jezebel was already threatening to kill him anyways. I found this in, in one of Brother Hagin's books. In James 5.17, you know, it actually talks about Elijah and it says Elijah was a man of like passions like we are. In other words, Elijah was human. Anybody passionate about something? Matthew and I were yelling, screaming last night in my office as we watched the lousy Texas game. <laughs> sure my neighbors heard us. We were absolutely disgusted. Don't look at me that way. You've got your own issues. <laughs> passionate. Elijah was passionate. Brother Hagin says this, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. He was, this is during a time that he was laying in bed, he was bedfast, and he says, I thought of Elijah is giving us an example of a righteous man who prayed and got results, then I'll study about him in the Bible, then I can follow his example and get results to my prayers. He said, but then the more that I read about Elijah, the more he reminded me of myself. Actually, that's just what James meant when he said, in effect, that Elijah was a man just like us. He was subject to the same human thoughts and emotions as we are. Elijah did have great moments. We all know that. Of course, we mentioned some of those. 
But when he got to Jezreel, someone told him, Jezebel said that by this time tomorrow, she's going to make sure you're dead. So Elijah started running. But this time, the hand of the Lord wasn't upon him. It was just Elijah running in fear. Elijah ran into, until he was too tired to run anymore and then said, just let me die. Elijah didn't want to die any more than the person does out of frustration when they say, I might as well be dead. See, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. Lord, Elijah said, you might as well let me die. I'm the only one left. Everyone else is backslidden. These folks today who say no one else has the truth except for me and my bunch, I'm so glad they're wrong. God had to correct Elijah and he turned to him and he said, no, I have 7,000 reserved to myself who have not bowed their knee. Don't ever feel like you're the only one. Don't ever feel like I'm the only one experiencing this, good or bad. Here's Elijah. And I, I, hope, I hope one day I could do any of these things that he did. Elijah. This is one of the great men of the Bible that we hear from, talk about. And yet the Bible says he was just like us, subject to like passions and human frailty as we are. But God didn't take his life. If you go on and read, the Lord's response to him saying, take away my life in verse number 5. As he lay and slept under the juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked under the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because your journey is too great for you. Listen, your journey is too great for you to quit. Your journey is too great for you to throw in the towel and say, I can't take it anymore. He arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat for 40 days. God didn't take Elijah's life, but He gave him strength to keep going. In this particular instance, all Elijah needed was a good meal and a good nap. Anybody need a good meal and a good nap? Maybe you get ready to experience both of those. I'm not making light of the issue here. But you see the point? The Lord says, take a moment. Quit getting so worked up. I've got this. I've got this. Sit and eat a little bit. Take a nap. We don't have time to get there, but you know, take a nap. There's a lot of scriptures in the Bible that says he'll give you sweet sleep. Because the reality is, is that, that if you're worked up about a situation, you know, I've been working on a workshop. We showed Wednesday a, a workshop that I'm, I'm building. You know, it does just a simple thing. I just decided, you know what, I want to, actually Sheila helped me decide it. She said, you need a project. So I started building this workshop and so, so because I'm building this workshop, it's on my mind. And if you, you know, when you get involved in something like this, if you're not careful, it mentally consumes you to where you're thinking about the next step and what I need to do and how I need to do it. And, and I got to th- remember this and I got to remember that and I got to think about this. And well, if you trust God, faith sleeps well at night. Amen. If you trust God, faith rests. And you're not consuming yourself with all the details and how to figure it out. and how. To... Listen, we're talking about every circumstance that you come in c- across. Whether it's that coworker, whether it's a health issue, whether it's those kids at home, no matter what it is, if you're not careful, you'll consume yourself to the point that you're not resting. And the Lord told him here, hey, stop, eat, rest a while, I've got this. Can you see that? Amen. We all come to the end of ourselves at times. So struggling mentally doesn't make you less of a Christian, it makes you human. Facing one challenge after another. We all get to a point where you say, I can't take it anymore. But what's your proper response? What are you going to do? Jesus in Matthew chapter 11 verse 28 says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, I will find rest for your soul. 
for your mind. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are of a crushed spirit. Psalm, 30, Psalm 73, 26 says, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart. Thank God for that. Somebody say, God is the strength of my heart. The battle of the mind is won when we maintain a right mental attitude and we walk in peace. Everybody say, my mind is my mind. Thank God for that. I said, thank God for that. Glory to God. Turn over to, to uh, Philippians chapter 4. We'll close here. Philippians chapter 4. Stressing the importance of trusting the Lord. Allowing His peace to be your guide. One powerful way to do that is found in Philippians chapter 4. Verse number 8. We actually read, let's just go back to verse number 6. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ. But watch this. He says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just and pure and lovely, Whatsoever things are of a good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Think on these things. Verse 9, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, then the peace of God shall be with you. He's told you how to combat those, those thoughts and those worries and those fears. Think on these things. Make the choice today that no matter what it is that you're going through, you're going to decide for yourself, you know what, I'm going to focus on the good report. You know what, I got up this morning. That's something to rejoice about. Come on now, my kids are dressed and we got to church. That's something to rejoice about. You're alive today. That's something to rejoice about. Everybody stand to your feet. Oh, thank God. I said, thank God. Thank God, thank God, thank God. Glory to God. I love in Proverbs 3.22, it says, The word shall be life unto my soul and grace to my neck. The word. The word. You know, we spend a lot of time as preachers and pastors talking about the Word of God, but the reality is, is the Word of God is the very thing that's going to keep you. It's the very thing that offers you success every single time. But you have to make the decision for yourself that you're going to allow the Word of God to be the very thing that keeps you rooted and grounded and settled. That will keep Him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. But again, it's a choice you make. Just like this Young man that I talked about at school, he had a decision to make. He had a choice to make. My mama's made provision for me, but I got to do my part. But the Lord's told you the same thing today. Maybe you're going through a challenge. Maybe mentally, emotionally, man, you've got some stuff you're dealing with. The Lord would say, trust me, I've got this. Peace be still, I've got this. Quit allowing your mind to race and roam and wander. I've got this. Aren't you so glad that He's got it? So if He's got it, do you? The Bible says casting the whole of your care over on Him for He cares for you. All of it. So Lord, I give it to you. That ought to release you this morning as I don't have to figure it out anymore. I don't know what to do. Thank God for that. Because then what you do is you say, Lord, I don't know what to do. I'm going to trust you. <laughs> say, it's that easy. Yes, it's that easy. I trust you. Lord, whatever it is that we're going through this morning, we trust you. Whoever it is this morning, wherever you may be, 
You've been consumed with fear and doubt and worry over the situation you've been dealing with. You've been trying to figure out how the Lord's going to fix it, solve it. The Lord would say to you, peace be still. Get ready for a great calm. Because He's got this. He's got this. Oh, thank God He's got this. Thank God for the peace of God that's getting ready to come in your situation and supernaturally cause you to experience a calm and a peace like you've never experienced before. Oh, trust Him this morning. Place your trust in Him this morning. He'll come through for you every single time. I said He'll come through for you every single time. He is faithful. He is faithful. He is dependable. He's never let us down. Glory to God. Oh, peace be still. Peace be still in your situation. Peace be still. Glory to God. Whatever that situation may be, I encourage you today, you look that situation right square in the eyes and you say, peace be still. You say, you'll no longer torment me. You'll no longer cause me to be consumed with this matter. You just cast it over on Him and you just allow Him to work. Can you do that today? Glory to God. If there's anybody in the sound of my voice this morning, do you say, I don't know what it means to place my care, place my trust in the Lord. I don't have that kind of relationship with Him. Well, before I snap my finger this morning, you can experience a peace like never before. If you've never made Jesus Lord of your life this morning, in the moment, in a moment, things can be different for you. So if you've never made Jesus Lord of your life, if you don't know what it means to have a relationship with Him this morning, I want to pray with you right where you are. Not interested in calling you out. This is between you and the Lord, anyways. But I do want to pray for you. Or maybe you've had that relationship with Him, but you know for a fact that you've backed away. You're, you're not as close as you used to be. You're what they call backslid. We've, we've got a gentleman that comes to the church occasionally that just says, Well, just slide back. If you're backslidden, just slide back. Amen. It's that easy. This morning, if that's you, I'm just going to ask everybody to bow your head, close your eyes, just in an attitude of worship. This is just between you and God anyways. If that's you, if I'm talking to you, if you don't have a relationship with the Lord, or maybe you, you've backslidden, or you've just stepped away from the truth that you do know, if you would please, just slip up your hand. I just want to pray for you right where you are. Glory to God. Place your trust in Him this morning. Place your trust in Him this morning and watch your great storm turn into a great calm. Glory to God. Anybody at all? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, praise the Lord. Casting all of your care over on Him for He cares for you. Somebody say, my mind is my mind. You just declare that. You just keep declaring that. My mind is my mind. What are you saying when you declare that? You're saying, I don't care about worries and frets and fears and all those things. In my mind, I have the mind of Christ, therefore my mind is my mind. And you just think God's thoughts. You just keep going back to Philippians and you just keep thinking the good report. You just keep, it about, keep thinking about the lovely things, the good things. The things that benefit. You keep thinking about all those things and you just let all that other, you just cast all that over on Him because He cares for you. Glory to God. You got anything? Glory to God. Aren't you so glad? Aren't you so glad? He's ready to do the unthinkable in your life. He's ready to turn your situation around. Just trust Him. Can you do that this morning? Praise God. God bless you. We love you. I think Brother Doug's coming. Amen. Amen. That's a good word, brother. Um, I'm staying up here, I guess. I, I, you know, I just want to, uh, I, I just want to take th a few minutes here this morning. We want to honor uh, Miss Margaret. 
You know, it was her birthday. You know, and I could say a lot of things uh, about Miss Margaret. You know, she's a she's a a woman of the word, a woman of the wisdom of God, the spirit of God. Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what else I could say. I mean, that's 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 a lot. <laughs> uh, and anyway, and we love you, and we just want to wish you a, a very blessed and happy birthday. Um, if you want, um, let, let's just do like we always do. Miss Margaret, you come on up here. And, and uh, uh, well, normally my wife wants me to sing happy birthday, but, you know, let, let's just do it. Y'all want to? <laughs> All right. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Miss Margaret. Happy birthday to you. Amen. Let's just, uh, if y'all got cards or whatever, if you want to bless her anyway, uh, y'all just bring the uh, the um, offering plate up here. And y'all just kind of work your way around this way and hug her, tell your lover. I won't be the first. I love you so much. Thank <laughs> you.